Okay, my presentation today will be a, a very strategic in nature. And then the purpose of sharing, of course, with the academia is to uh, probably later we'll probably get, get together and, and induce more collaboration between industry and, uh, and uh, academic. Because I think that is very, very important for the industry uh, as well as, of course, the, the, uh, on the academic side. Because going to the future, things going not to, to be the it's not going to be the, 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 the usual thing that industry see uh, uh, in the past uh, probably few hundred years. This is, this is going to change uh, so much. Uh, and then, uh, okay, uh, probably I can probably start my uh, presentation. So I will, I will probably uh, talk a little bit about the Naga National Brahat, very, very brief on that. Uh, and then we'll go through some fundamental things that things that won't change, uh, no matter no matter uh, how advanced we go in the future. The fundamentals will be the same. And then of course we we'll talk a little bit about energy transition, where uh, we are moving from from the different type of 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 scenarios. I would say not only on the risk, uh, on the uh, on the uh, resources side, but also on the demand side. And then. Uh, We'll, we'll go through some of the aspiration of grid uh, of the Naga National in the, in the grid of the future, and then and then probably touch a little bit of going forward, but more onto the the research related uh, uh, content going forward. Okay, so we'll start with the uh, Naga National uh, uh, steps. So at the moment we are quite okay. Let me switch to pointer. Uh, okay, the total generation capacity of Tenaga National is about uh, fourteen thousand. Okay, uh, and mind me, that is probably you can actually use it as a as an indicator because this is not a most updated stat, but but it's close to uh, it's close to current. Uh, at the moment, we have, uh, uh, as in Tanaga National, we have about 1.82% uh, uh, renewable oil, and then you see the majority of, of the fuel will be from uh, coal and gas. Uh, and then the total asset of 142 billion uh, with 666.5 circuit kilometers of transmission and distribution line. Um, 79 substation and then uh, 92 uh, transmission and distribution transformers. And then uh, for the total customer at the moment stand at 9 million, uh, more or less. And then the, the energy, average energy sales about 17 million, uh, 17 gigawatt hour. 117 gigawatt hour. And then uh, the, our performance index on the Average interruption duration index is about 50 minutes. Um, okay, the employee strength about 35,000. And then, uh, of course, uh, TMB has, uh, has uh, made a footprint in, in several countries in UK, Pakistan, uh, Saudi, and uh, Turkey, Kuwait, Indonesia, and India. Okay. Um, Okay, the, 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 just a brief about the, the, the national grid. Uh, at the moment, uh, on the grid side, we are taking care of, I would say, um, the, the, the backbone of the, of the electricity uh, network in Malaysia. Uh, we have uh, voltage ranges from 500 kV, 2,000 kV, and also uh, 300 kV HVDC. Okay, so I'll go into the HVDC part. We have link in the north with uh, our neighboring country, Thailand, in the north, uh, which is uh, our HVDC on a 300 kV capacity uh, of capacity about 300 megawatt. And then also, we also have a HVAC uh, overhead line uh, with, also with, with Thailand, with uh, a part of southern Thailand on the 132 kV uh, network. Uh, and uh, down south, uh, we have we are, we are uh, we have an AC synchronous uh, synchronous uh, connection with uh, uh, Singapore uh, to uh, uh, 
Then to take care of the submarine cable, uh, which uh, the capacity of our final megawatt is. So uh, we are very much connected with our neighbors. And then uh, this is probably uh, one of the things that spurs, that later whisper uh, the dream of Asian Green uh, that, that we, are, we are being uh, talking about for, for the past many years. So in terms of, of it itself, okay, I'm going to, I want to go to this again. Okay, so let's let's go to the the probably the, the, the fundamentals of things. Uh, the way the way I see it, uh, uh, we are moving uh, in the in the new new age, the new era of of uh, utility, which we have to um, take, taking care of a, a trilemma. Obviously, a trilemma. I think you have heard of this uh, before, I believe. Uh, we have to balance up reliability, uh, meaning that we have to we have to uh, mitigate with blackouts and then and then there's, uh, minimizing outage impacts. Uh, we have to make sure that our assets, which is which is like like you, you see just now, uh, so many thousands of assets and then so many thousands of kilometers of hundreds of thousand kilometers of uh, uh, lines and 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 circuits. So we have to like ensure that our asset is in good condition all the time, and then we also have to improve uh, our fault detection and, and also moving towards the the prevention of even the fault happening. And then at the same time, we also have to have uh, look at affordability because because we we have to maintain uh, uh, electricity affordable to uh, common region. Uh, I would say I have to say that a common religion because because uh, 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 that is the 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 I would say that the, the scale that we have to use uh, meaning that we have to improve efficiency all the time you know uh, maximizing flow in a constrained and aging grid and then the other thing is our grid is aging because we have built up this grid uh, since uh, 50 up uh, 60 70 years ago uh, and then on the other hand, the, the new the new age coming where where we also have to connect uh, distributed energy resources to the energy system, and then and then of course uh, the other one is to have a, a leveraging information across supply chains is one of the key I would say that key success factor that that, that we are uh, looking at, uh, and then also on the other hand with with the uh, on the hand I mean it's because it's trilemma on the third hand uh, it will be like a, a the push to to go uh, on the CO two free energy. This is uh, uh, starting with Kyoto uh, signing and also Paris Agreement recently. Uh, Malaysia aspiration is actually to go uh, on the on the uh, certain level of CO two. You remember what is what the level, but we have to go to certain level of percentage uh, of. Uh, I would say that CO two free uh, energy. So uh, the, the the challenge there is 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 uh, okay. We'll talk about the challenge. This uh, is what what this session all about. Okay. Um, okay. The, on the fundamental thing that I was talking about just now. Uh, uh, no matter how the how the the, the scenario change, uh, we always need to balance supply and demand. This is this is uh, uh, of course the very fundamental uh, since the, the birth of, of electricity system. Um, I would say that uh, uh, supply and demand has to be balanced, and then uh, the grid. I mean, when I mentioned about the grid, I think it's a, I would refer I would refer to uh, the whole power delivery system, which is coming from the supply uh, right into the, the where the electricity is is, uh, is needed. Uh, on the demand side, so in the middle there's a grid, there's a, uh, a grid grid system, I would say, um, and then we have a few indicators like like uh, this is normal. I think I think sorry to run through this uh, with the uh, I believe the the S team academician will will actually have to get bored in this. But anyway, uh, uh, balancing of two, two, two type of power. One type of power is active power, which the indicator will be frequency. And then the other the other uh, power is the reactive power with the indicator of voltage. And then on the on the grid side, of course, we we have losses, we have failures due to uh, internal or external factors. And grid also has uh, a physical limitation. It's always physics behind it, it uh, meaning that you cannot 
and cannot uh, transfer a certain amount of power with with lack of inadequate grid. So we have to 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 ensure that uh, uh, our grid is in a uh, quite a top uh, condition. And then looking at on the on the on the left side here, I would say that that is the I don't know whether you can see it, that is actually the power demand daily power demand uh, for for Malaysia. Uh, the, the way the way we say things is is okay. This is like twelve midnight to 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 twelve midnight, and you see that morning. Uh, this is why people are sleeping. It's not much of a of a uh, load uh, demand, and then and then uh, it goes up. Okay, uh, it goes up uh, when people start going to the office and all that. This is normal. This is a pre-pandemic type of uh, uh, pattern. And then it go up, peak around to sometime around eleven to twelve, and then come down again during lunch hour. After lunch hour, uh, look start picking up again because people start going to the office, and then the the sun hitting quite quite. Uh, uh, I mean. Uh, the heat coming back and then of course people start going down and then and then start going back from the office and then uh, while traveling load is quite low and then at night they're picking up again start start to, to uh, cooking uh, tv and all those and then start to road start to rise again and then start to come down this is like a normal pattern for 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 malaysia and then i don't think i think we have several other i mean maybe most of other countries and then you see that the two down there is one probably a saturday saturday one and also weekend which is a different pattern so my uh, this is the the kind of variability in the system at the moment i mean uh, previously because the variability come from the demand the way people uh, use electricity um uh, okay uh, but, and, and then another thing is the variability of this demand is i would say very very much predictable we we are it's like getting used to it and then and then uh, it's not it's not becoming a problem for us because because we know uh, the forecasting is very very easy uh and then if you go if you if you're looking at this this balance between reliability of reliability like i told you before at the moment uh probably not at the moment very previously in the past we have these two uh uh scale to balance we also have to balance the power as well at this time we have to balance reliability and affordability we have to be we have to, to supply the, the uh, electricity uh, reliably and also keep the cost uh, at a very affordable level and then on the supply side you see that uh when you have a, a variability they always on the other side of the coin is we need flexibility so uh, with this kind of reliability it is no problem for our conventional generators now we are we are like running like uh, like i mentioned previously coal gas hydros and uh, some uh, uh, mix of, of fuel the mix of fuel uh, actually can handle the sort of variability in terms of uh, the flexibility going up and down meaning that uh, we are uh, on the on the supply side we are okay with the flexibility to cater for the current variability and then the grid is always, of course, uh, uh, I would say that plan to cater for that. Uh, okay, this is one that we have to keep uh, supply and demand balance. And then the supply and demand balance has to be real time. I know that it's, it's not that uh, it's not that we can wait to sort of balance the supply and demand. It's always happen uh, continuously and uh, and uh, uh, instantaneously. I mean, that's a that's a basic of it, right? So uh, the, the the next one that we are we are we are looking at is of course uh, we are we will avoid ourselves going into the power system stability which, which, which can actually cause large disturbance both in a, a actually uh, the, the 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 voltage stability the frequency stability and as well as the roto angle stability. What is not here is the uh, I would say that inequality inequality equation where I would say that it's also important for us to maintain the power flow on certain line not beyond the capacity the physical capacity of the of the uh, network uh, it, meaning that it is I would say that the other portion that is not here is uh, actually uh, we also have a thermal issue that 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 uh, uh, 
that we have, we have to uh, take take care of. Uh, if you go to the long, uh, roto stability, of course, there's two things: a small small disturbance, urgent stability. This is related to first side, to the generation side, and then the voltage stability mainly is related to the load side, and then the frequency stability is uh, 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 we are looking at the the adequacy of active power in the system. Um, okay, uh, let's let move on. Uh, okay, then keeping that fundamental in mind. The two things that will never will will never change for for utility. Then we move into uh, energy transition scenarios for for Malaysia. So our our aspiration is like to have a, a 1.2 gigawatt by 2020 and 4 gigawatt by by uh, 2025. Of mainly 70% of it will come from solar because uh, the country is blessed with solar. Because we're in the tropical area, and then on on the other hand, being in the tropical, there's other disadvantage that we are probably the highest cloud cover country in the world. So there is like like a sort of a, a, like an offset to solar, but but anyway, we have a, a mainly a, a eyeing for for a solar as our source of a renewable renewable, and then a, a, when I when I put the the the, the grey mark remark there, two gigawatt coming from rooftop. Uh, now, I think uh, part of the rooftop that is through FIT and also a uh, net metering uh, uh, initiative that our government has uh, put up. Uh, that in 4 megawatt, that, that scheme includes in that 4 megawatt. But what, what we are afraid of is because of the solar solar system, the solar panels and, and, and the, the, the supporting system like inverters and all that. Um, will become cheaper and cheaper so there is no excuse because people will start going voluntarily into the grid like what happened in australia people just putting uh, 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 solar rooftop and also uh, when battery come a very attractive price then then people start putting battery and even uh, last few weeks i got offer from a friend to for me to go off grid meaning that uh, it will put uh, enough solar panel and uh, with battery backup for night time, and and to go like not not really off grid, but still grid connected, but uh, but uh, mainly independent of grid uh, at any particular time. So what I'm seeing this, if this trend is 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 going on, the the, the thing is uh, the problem will become uh, uh, the grid is seen only as backup. Meaning that, meaning that the all infrastructures that we put, all, all, everything on the grid that they are preparing, it will become a backup system to, to most of the people. And then, and also, uh, when looking at the socioeconomic thing, uh, people who are who can afford this, meaning that still, well, even though it's going coming down, uh, but, but there's a certain level of, of uh, income group that actually can afford this kind of thing. So they go off grid, but then the, the, the grid investment that we have put to cater even for the backup one will be shared among all nations. And then the problem will become the, 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 the unit cost of, of uh, electricity will start rising. Uh, because of people start going into this kind of system, so this is the kind of thing that 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 uh, is our our uh, challenge at the moment. And then, uh, of course, this is a very challenging time as well as uh, uh, I would say exciting time for 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 people to enter the utility business. I mean, to utility, uh, even the work, new workforce, they they will be looking at. A different thing that we are looking like what people said about uh, I think there's a joke about like, yeah a joke about Edison and they're comparing Edison and uh, Thomas Edison and uh, Alexander Graham Bell where where before grid before if Edison come back from the dead and they're seeing uh, the electricity infrastructure he will not be surprised by the by the by the thing you'll see the transformer is a transformer uh, uh, electricity line is a line cable is a cable but when Bell wake up from that and you see all the communication the progress that the telecommunication sector has made he will not recognize any of uh, his uh, invention before so that is the, the, the thing that i would say that it's very challenging and very exciting to to, to go into the the uh, power industry business 
Okay, let's look at the, the because since we are we are going seventy percent or probably more when we we just take up the voluntary take up, then we'll see that uh uh what is what are the, what are some of the challenges uh uh in in uh, in solar uh this is with the, uh, in the in the in the point of view of utility, of course it's reduced dynamic power resources. Now we are changing from asynchronous machine sources into I would say IDR, also uh, inverter-based resources, which is more power electronics uh, type of technology, to replace the asynchronous machine with also have okay, the, the, the further right here with a lot of inertia. We are taking away the inertia because by 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 uh, I think 2030 or so, and this is a government aspiration that we are reducing. Uh, our last uh, coal plant, and uh, and then the replacement of that coal plant will be will be the inverter based resources uh, such as uh, solar uh, solar. So uh, we can actually appreciate how much loss of inertia at that time going forward into the future uh, into the system and the impact of inertia uh, as uh, you, you all know that uh, maintain a. Uh, uh, I mean, to push a big guy down the drain is very, very hard compared to the push to the of a of a skinny guy into the drain. That's why I say that's my definition of inertia. Uh, uh, and then, uh, you see that uh, technically, what it means is any loss of uh, last generation in the low inertia environment will cause our frequency to go down rapidly and more severely in terms of level. That's so why that is the, the, the challenge, one, one, one of the challenges uh, that, that introduced by the uh, energy transition. And also, if you're looking at intermittency and variability, okay, so, uh, on the clear sky, even on the clear sky day, this is, uh, I'm taking this from some source, but anyway, we have uh, track or monitor our, our solar uh, output from our large scale solar. It is very, very much similar. Because uh, it looks like, like in the morning our sun, our cloud cover is not that much. But then uh, we are uh, experiencing a, a, a cloudy day and then very intermittency in the, in the afternoon. And then uh, uh, in terms of uh, influence of rain and then also the influence of, 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 of the cloudy day uh, uh, compared to the, the sunny day like the first one. Uh, and also with the with the position of, of solar placement uh, in the grid, we also we are also seeing a changing fault level because before fault level is calculated from the source to the to, to where the, the, the point of interest uh, uh, are, but now since uh, the, the the source can come from anywhere, so uh, we are seeing this uh, level. Uh, uh, Pose a problem or any problem to us. Okay, that's also a dark of. Uh, okay, that's actually very very tough for me to keep the time. Uh, uh, may I know how much time do I have, uh, uh, Mr. MC? Actually, the session is for the forty five minutes, so you almost have fifteen minutes. I only 15 minutes left, right? Yeah, you can take okay. uh, Sorry. more than 15 minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll split it up. Okay, I just go into the duck curve. Okay, duck curve. Okay, the easiest one is to say that this is one of the impact of solar. You see that we call it duck because the, the back of it and the neck of it is a, is a shape of a duck. So the, the problem is uh, when, when the sun is shining, uh, I would say that uh, the, the blue curve is a net load and then, and then the actual load will be like on top of here, but because of the impact of solar, actually uh, the, the, the net load from the conventional generator will be low, but the problem is uh, there's no technology to stop the sun from set, setting. So uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day, the sun set, and then the generator has to pick up to, to serve the, the, the night load. Okay, so I have to go faster now. Okay, uh, in the future, we are seeing that the, 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 the variability and flexibility also in the demand side. And also flexibility availability because of the the, the, the intermittent or, or the uh, inverter based or resources coming in, we are seeing the variability also on the supply side. So we're not only seeing one side of the the equation. Now there are two sides of the equation having the same flexibility and reliability. So this is the, the thing that we need to manage. But the, the, the fundamental remain the same. 
uh, we need to supply the balance between supply and demand. And of, of course, that's a sustainability uh, is another part of it, uh, adding into the, 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 the normal equation of reliability and affordability. Yeah, okay. Okay, the, the, the traditional media system, I would say that before the power flow is going from, from, sorry, is going from one source to another, from, from generation. Okay, sorry, the, the generation here, uh, the, uh, uh, I was referring to classical generation, not actually a, a wind and all this, but a classical uh, uh, large inertia generation at the moment, going into the transmission network, going to the distribution network, all the way to the retailers, and then uh, going to the cost, uh, consumer. Uh, but then in the modern, in the modern uh, complex electric energy, uh, that, that there's, all, there's still also, uh, 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 I would say that the, the traditional resources combined with the large scale solar, and then, unfortunately, Malaysia at the moment do not have uh, a win because of our, our, our the factor of geography and all that. But then it's moving forward towards uh, transmission network, going to distribution the same. And then, but but on the on the on the demand side now, there's the, the, creating a variability because of the rooftop solar, and then as well as a uh, uh, I would say that uh, the consumer side also now become prosumer. And also that on the consumer side, they can put battery in, and there's there's a term or there's a there's a term about it. We we'll call it uh, a solar rooftop with uh, battery storage. We call it a prosumer or something like that. That's a new that's a new term. But anyway, uh, we are saying that now power flow is already uh, bidirectional. So uh, the anticipated change, I would say that from large power plant to a smaller uh, power producer. Uh, we are seeing uh, centralized, most on the national level, but now it's going decentralized. There's no more boundaries uh, between the the the, the nodes. Uh, based on okay, it is on 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 the uh, aluminium infrastructure into a, a, a smarter, small scale transmission and regional supply uh, compensation. It is uh, before it's, uh, like like we said, it's a top bottom. One way now we are going bidirectional, and also consumer now become a uh, prosumer. They are they are they are putting in more. Uh, we say that uh, uh, they are power, uh, power producer, power producing. So uh, okay, let's uh, okay. I let's skip this. This is like 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 because of the of the time. I would say I will skip this. Uh, just saying that M E is interested in in in. Uh, uh, I would say venturing, not uh, yeah, venturing or providing into in terms of future generation resources. We are investing in renewable. We are improving our generation side efficiency and and flexibility. And then uh, uh, we are um, our main focus now in the middle is a grid of the future, where we are looking at the automate, automate, automated and more digitalized grid. Uh, and then we are expecting bidirectional network for for this uh, distributed generation. And then our investment has shifted from the traditional infra into the new uh, high impact technology, which include, uh, I mean, uh, which possibly include uh, more more of uh, investment in our electronics and all that. And then, of course, on the on the on the on the customer side, we are uh, I, I think you all know that we are rolling out our our smart meter smart meter infrastructure program to 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 have a, a connected customer. So the way we see the objective of the of the of the, grid of the future is to have a strong, flexible, and intelligent grid. That's that's uh, the, the way we are going in our strategic uh, direction. Uh, of course, it, it is to for for more renewable uh, uh, coming in to to uh, 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 realize the aspiration of the nation. And then, uh, uh, of course, to cater for bidirectional power, uh, bidirectional power flow in terms of, of catering for prosumers that, that have their 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 uh, generation production on its own, and then the prosumers that that get together into uh, uh, probably uh, some sort of microgrids that, that that can create on 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 the on the level of uh, cons consumption basis, and also the the rise of is slowly picking up in, in Malaysia the rise of uh, uh, electric, uh, electrification of mobility in terms of electric cars and all that electric vehicle. Okay, on the other side, we have also to cater for 
because of these two uh, factor, uh, grid has become very very complex to to uh, to operate. Uh, that's why we need uh, we just not also need the the, the strong and flexible uh, resources, but we also need an uh, intelligent element in the in the uh, grid operation. So the way I uh, look at the technologies uh, on the on the on the other side that that uh, for the loss of inertia, I think uh, is to make your grid bigger. So one of the of the aspiration uh, uh, of uh, Tenaga National as well as the government is to actually forming up a, a ancient power ancient power grid. Uh, that is connecting uh, uh, many 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 different uh, ASEAN country uh, and then and then of course if you're connecting ASEAN country and then Vietnam already connected to China then we are part of that last grid so uh, the loss of initia due to uh, due to uh, introduction of uh, inverter based resources uh, will be uh, minimized and then also on the we have a reduced dynamic voltage source that, that I mentioned just now uh, the, the, the technology that, that we are looking at is a fax device, which is a uh, mainly power electronics or statcoms and SVC. Uh, uh, and then on the on the on, on the on the uh, fog, fog current uh, in, uh, increase of fog current, and then uh, uh, I would say that not only increase but I would say changing fog current le uh, level. We are looking at limiters and all that. We are, we are using uh, uh, series reactors uh, uh, mainly. At the moment, and then there's a lot of technology uh, uh, advancement in the in the fog current limiter, uh, and also on the on the on the demand side. On the demand side, we're looking at a, 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 a demand side flexibility, such as a, a demand response, and then uh, of course the electric vehicle can be two way. It can be a consumption when 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 they're charging the battery, and also becoming a, a source when the when the when the full charge, and then. And of course, consumer is looking into this uh, the flexibility of them gaining uh, income from what they can provide to the grid and become a, 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 a producer of power and uh, as a backup power. So, uh, in terms of that of intermittency, of course, uh, we are also uh, together with with. Uh, Kementerian government also we are we are looking to the possibility of of, of putting up a, a, a grid connected battery storage system. Uh, if uh, uh, when we the, the study of techno economy uh, come about, then then we will will uh, decide whether we should go or not. And then also there's also uh, I would say uh, the creation of the, the new and innovative business model. Let's say a virtual power plant. Which is connecting uh, many many uh, 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 dispersed uh, generation source, and also a, a, a demand uh, demand side flexibility. Combining that together with the batteries and 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 the microgrid, they, they are forming up a, a, a new business model uh, in terms of virtual power plant. Meaning that the operation you will see like uh, these resources working together as as one uh, big power plant to the to the to the grid, it's like a one big power plant, one side power plant. But actually, it is consists of a very very small uh, 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 resources and flexibility. Okay, uh, I would say that uh, I just want to highlight here. Uh, looks like time is time is is very very jealous of me. Uh, uh, it looks like uh, okay. Before we have an electrical connection connecting many many things, many many network and all that in the blue blue line, and also now the need. Because of you will see the distributed electrical control. Like when I say uh, before in the traditional grid, we have probably few thousand uh, element to control to orchestrate. I would say few few thousand system that because we wish we can still handle from a, from a centralized place from I would say a centralized control system. But now with I would say that you'll go to millions of of, of smart devices. Uh, 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 in the in the, the connect degree, then uh, centralized control or centralized orchestration is no longer valid. We are looking into the distributed electrical control, where 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 the 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 dots there the intelligent node have the uh, autonomous meaning that op autonomous optimized operation for the for the particular area, and then. Uh, 
on the on the high side, if you're looking at global optimization, meaning that uh, it, it worked two ways: uh, local and optimized uh, local uh, local optimization, as well as the, on the global system that have a, a, a global intelligence and global optimize, uh, global optimization. Uh, in to achieve that, in order to achieve that, we are now embarking on the digitalization program, where uh, uh, I would say that that. We, our policy now is going to smart connected asset, meaning that the, the, the electrical infrastructure now will have uh, will going uh, sensorization, IOTs, and all this uh, is is uh, part of our I would say uh, uh, aspiration and, and and strategy going forward uh, is to to have our our asset uh, connected into the intelligent infrastructure. So on the digital side, we will do. We will do coordination, optimization, monitoring, command and control, uh, and and all that self healing, and also uh, uh, analytics. Uh, most of the people uh, are talking about the way to, to read this is like uh, uh, this is a smart centralized generation, smart transmission, smart distribution, and smart consumption. In the green area, I would say that uh, on the on the generation side, they're working on the on to have more flexibility, more optimized, more efficient generation, and then uh, the on the on this uh, middle portion is about uh, grid transmission and distribution, where we are applying uh, uh, a new type, a new network capacity, new uh, type, and then power electronics and all that. And on the customer side, we have, we are we are we are actively supporting the the prosumer. Uh, prosumer need uh, on the on the demand side. So uh, you're looking at the at the at the system side. You will see that we are already embarking on the on the wide area monitoring and control. Uh, we are working on the on synchronized sensor, which is a, a phase management unit. And on the distribution side, we're looking at distribution automation and, and predictive algorithm. And then on the on the connection of the Asian grid, uh, of course, as we did see, you have applied that. And the midline rating where, where it, it goes into the adoption of, uh, of the true capacity of line to adoption of uh, uh, weather condition. And then on the, on the of course, we are looking at facts, power electronics and all those uh, for current limit that like I mentioned to you. And then also on the uh, uh, on energy efficiency, uh, on the uh, conservation voltage reduction. And then on the, on the customer side, uh, we are also looking at the vehicle to grid net metering uh, system that I mentioned, uh, smart meters there, and then also a demand response. So uh, that will basically bring to the to the to the sorry to the exciting area. How are we going to achieve this? So, uh, um, Mr. MC, I, I probably have to take another five, but anyway, to explain this, uh, uh, we have set up in the, in the, on the laboratory. Uh, uh, Scale uh, on, on the I call it a grid of the future digital twins because uh, what we are putting in our, our simulator is the actual grid system, in the model of the actual grid system uh, uh, <coughs> on the network on the network infrastructure as well as the dynamic behavior of grid, so that we are building a, a, a model of of. A modern grid because now you know, we are looking to the future. We, we can't predict what happened. So the cheapest way to go, I will say that I would say not cheapest, but lowest cost to go, is to build all this and and into the into the very close uh, to the grid uh, type of behavior. So we can actually conduct many many research or, or many many uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, innovative. Uh, way of doing things and then uh, start playing around with it in the lab control environment and then and then people can start doing uh, uh, research on both sides even on the on the new element that is on the grid that, that actually can be incorporated into the model as well as the intelligent part the 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 the, the, the self-healing the smart grid part onto this onto this uh, the other side of uh, on this side of the of the system so uh, uh, we are building this uh, we are not building it sorry we are have built it but we are we are we are of course uh, it is an, a, a, I would say that a growing system a, a life system that that we are 
uh, uh, really putting our our effort before we actually go into certain technology, uh, before we actually make a decision on the on the on the uh, high impact investment, all that we are we are pro uh, we use this, and then this is probably the gateway for us and uh, uh, academic to actually has this uh, uh, increased collaboration that we can we can uh, 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 moving forward. So this is just a, a picture of that uh, where where we, we are seeing this uh, we are we are simulating that we see the frequency uh, stability we are seeing uh, 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 we are we are simulating a, a last generation skipping and then we will see the the overloading of the thermal uh, thermal violation of the system and then we we'll, uh, we will see the, the, the uh, so many things well, this is like one sample of it so uh, I think that is the probably uh, the the, the End of my my presentation. Then probably uh, we have a, a more of a Q and A after this. Thank you, Mr. MC. I want to ask question: As the energy, as the population increase, the global population of human increase, so also the energy demand increase. And due to the adverse effect of the conventional generation of uh, electricity. Uh, the world is now moving or tilted towards uh, renewable and alternative source of energy. Now, Prof, uh, with all the limitations and challenges of such renewable energy, what do you think uh, can be a solution to the conventional electricity, uh, uh, means of electricity, generation of electricity, and uh, the prospect for the renewable energy? Thank you, Prof. Okay, uh, you say that uh, if I can understand the, the challenge of, 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 of going into uh, from conventional to uh, renewables, right? Uh, that's, yes, bro. Uh, that's, yes, yeah. bro. Yeah, the, the, the thing is, I think I've uh, I think probably mentioned in, in a few of the, of the uh, points that I'm, I'm, I'm making. Uh, the way I see it, uh, because of the, of the uh, very variability of the now we are talking about renewable talking about variability i think that is the the the, the, the issue the big issue the intermittency and all that so the way i see it if if we are before uh, we are looking on on a very silo type of uh, type of uh, i would say type of a view that you're looking at uh, electricity resources as resources grid as grid and then the demand side as a demand side there is like one one way flow, but if, if you see as a holistic view of the total uh, uh, electricity uh, system, that we will see uh, intermittency in the load can actually be met by the by the by flexibility of even in the demand side. I would say the demand uh, if if the electricity is is high, uh, if the if the solar is coming coming in, uh, uh, meaning that the the demand side. Uh, I mean, if, if there is an intermittency, the drop in power from, from, from renewable, the demand side can drop and will still achieve the, the balance. That's it, my fundamental is, is supply and uh, demand balance, right? So uh, anything, any component in the grid that can actually provide this uh, balance, I would say it's more on the flexibility. We have looked to, to look into more flexibility resources. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether it's a conventional generator uh, flexibility. Or even in the in the power electronic world now, I believe uh, this probably can be confirmed by the power electronic expert uh, from the academic. Uh, we are moving from the grid forming uh, inverter into a grid. Oh, sorry, grid following inverter into the grid forming inverter. But now uh, uh, research has shown uh, that we are we are be able to to have a virtual synchronized machine using the the the, the inverter. You know that there's an emulation of inverter to become to look like uh, virtual synchronized machine to behave like uh, uh, VSM. So there is another question from our participant. Yes. That is there any opportunity for collaboration in wide area application? I mean, collaboration opportunity. Uh, okay, all right. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, I heard about that. Uh, uh, yes, I would say. I would say yes. Uh, we need more, more. Uh, I would say, uh, because now at the moment, TMB, we have Unit 10, of course. We have to go through Unit 10. But then uh, I think it's not limited to. I believe uh, uh, if we have uh, a good, uh, uh, 
we have a good platform and then we can always discuss about that. Uh, I will say uh, it's a big yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Nixon Fuzan, Bin Yusuf. So this is the end of our first session. Allow me to just briefly introduce about our research group uh, here in UTM, which is called the Paltronics and Drive Research Groups. We have 11 members um, within this group with diversified research interests, as you can see here, ranging from the active filters, harmonic integrations, to electric vehicles, uh, to the multi-level inverters control and design. Uh, if you are interested to know more about our research group, you can visit this uh, website here. Uh, we always open for any collaborations uh, with uh, everyone. All right, so here is going to be my contents and I hope, I, I think I will be also struggling with time like uh, Mr. Nick before just now. Uh, the uh, contents is going to be, um, is broken into three parts, the background modeling control and the research on the high performance three-phase induction motor drives. Um, I will talk about the modeling of the three-phase uh, VSI, which depends on how you control the VSI the three-phase induction motor model. And then I will talk some basics on the uh, FOC, the field-oriented control, the direct torque control, as well as the uh, predictive uh, torque control um, uh, um, of the induction motor drives, okay? And then later I will uh, talk on the high performance, um, uh, some of the research works that we have performed here in UTM on the high performance uh, three-phase induction motor drives. All right, some background um, and history about the high performance drive. The, uh, the, uh, the uh, high performance of induction motor drive is basically characterized by the precise torque speed opposition control of the motor drives, which is the three most common uh, variables that we want to control in electrical drives. And on top of that, these, uh, this response, which is Especially, uh, especially the uh, especially the uh, torque response has to be good and uh, 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 good, good dynamic response as well as good steady state response. To achieve this control, uh, these characteristics, we need to have uh, the torque and the flux components. The control of the torque and the flux component in the machines has to be decoupled, which means that it has to be independently controlled. Controlling the torque will not affect the flux and vice versa. And this happens to be relatively easy in DC, in DC motor, as we all know that because in DC motor, you know, the torque, which is the armature current, is always quadrature to the field flux, which is produced by the field uh, current or by the stator, or which can also comes from the permanent magnet uh, due to the commutator and the brushes actions, uh, which is the mechanical commutator and the brushes. But this thing is not going to be that um, easy uh, for the induction motor. Okay, the coupling, the decoupled control of the torque and flux is not going to be easy for the induction motor because the torque, uh, sorry, the uh, uh, stator flux and the rotor flux, which is interacting to produce the torque, is not coming from the different source. It is coming from the same source, which is the stator voltage. So the decoupling of this uh, component is not going to be as straightforward as we can see or we can have in the DC motor. Let's look like uh, let's uh, look back a little bit on the history of this high performance motor drive. You know, before the power electronics was introduced, um, the uh, high performance speed control of for any applications which require high performance speed control or precise speed or torque control is uh, conducted or is performed using uh, the multi machine configurations, which is uh, known as the Watt Leonard configurations. We, in which you have, in order to control the speed of the DC motor, you have to have a variable speed. And then that variable speed is coming from the generator, which is run or which is coupled to the uh, induction or AC machines, which is running at a constant speed. And we change the output of the DC generator by changing the field excitation. And then the SCR was invented in around 1958 there, which changed the whole thing because now, the uh, we uh, the, invert, in, the inverter is later uh, invented in which the uh, the uh, the variable frequency and the variable voltage supply 
uh, is now available, which can be used to directly control the AC motor instead of controlling, uh, instead of um, achieving it using the DC motor. However, during those time, uh, during when the, when the inverter was invented, uh, uh, um, until not until the 1970s when the field-oriented control was uh, introduced, the uh, high performance. Um, application is still dominated by the DC motor because there is no way that we can decouple the torque and the flux during those times. But then I would say that the first breakthrough in AC motor drives is when the FOC was introduced around in late, I think late 60s, early 70s by the two Germany, Germans, um, Hatze and Blaschk, uh, which was, was then uh, later commercialized in 1980s. FOC basically uh, transformed the uh, induction motor into similar to that of the of the DC motor in which the torque can be controlled precisely and quickly as similar to what we have in the DC motor. And then a second big breakthrough in AC drives, I would say the inventions of the uh, direct torque control in 1984 and the direct soft self control, which, which are basically almost the same control strategy here, which was developed at different parts of the world, one in German, Germany, the other one is in Japan, but they published the papers around the same area, which is in 1984, 1986. Uh, it was then commercialized by the ABB in 1990s. And um, the uh, recent development in AC motor drives out uh, now is, can be seen is the applications of what we call the model predictive control MPC to the motor drives and power electronics, um, power electronic systems. The MPC or the model predictive control was uh, was uh, applied to a slower system with larger time constant before, like, like for example, in the petrochemical system. But it was then applied to the power electronic systems around starting in the year 2000. So in this talk, I will be talking about these um, uh, three um, control techniques, which is the FOC, DTC, and MPC. All right, so let's look, let's look at on the modeling and control of the, um, of the voltage source inverter first. This is uh, the, uh, the uh, circuit diagrams of the inverter with IGBT. So you have three legs there. And then this, uh, each of the switch or is each of these power semiconductor devices is actually operated as a switch, which means that it is convenient for us to replace it just by a switch since, it's, since the operations of the semiconductor devices is just whether to turn on or turn off or uh, similar to the operations of the switch. Now, the... Uh, the first, uh, the, the most widely controlled uh, techniques uh, of the voltage source inverter is to use the uh, pulse width modulator, which the most common uh, types of modulator that is used now is, I think, would be the space vector pulse width modulations and the sinusoidal pulse width modulation, which is based on the comparisons between the sinusoidal and the, and the control signals. <clears throat> the way we do it is that uh, we are actually linearizing the output voltage of the converter over time, switching time, which means that we are actually uh, removing the nonlinear behavior of the inverter by linearizing this behavior, which means that the relationships between the uh, reference signals and the outputs becomes linear, which means that uh, once we do that, then we can control the inverter using an, a linear regulator such as the PI, PI controller here, which is shown here, which is used to control the current. Okay, in order to control current, then you have to have a feedback this is the motor, this is the VSI, we have to have feedback, which is compared to the reference here, which is coming from the, uh, for example, from the FOC or field oriented control controller. Now the, uh, the control in the current here is shown here is done in the two axis because we want to avoid the interference between the phases uh, if we control it in the, in the three phase environment or in the phase uh, coordinate systems. And also we perform the control in the synchronous reference frame, which is typical in most modern electrical drive systems to avoid you know, the problems of the lagging problem, uh, which, uh, which is encountered, which is uh, basically caused by the PI controller, which cannot uh, react to the moving reference or sinusoidal. If we do the control in the synchronous environment, synchronous reference frame, then everything here over this side is gonna be DC. And then in order to transform back to the AC or to stationary, then we have to know the positions of the uh, current vector, which is by estimating the uh, frequency or the synchronous frequency there. Another way of controlling the current is, of course, which is also typically applied for the FOC, is to use the nonlinear controller, which is shown here, which is the hysteresis uh, controller. Um, 
the uh, implementation easy, but there is uh, drawbacks to this hysteresis, uh, as we all know, which is causing the high ripples as well as variable switching frequency. All right, and um, another way of controlling the uh, of the uh, controlling the BSI of the inverter is to directly control the inverter without um, using the modulator, which means that the selections of the switching uh, states of this inverter is directly obtained from under uh, under certain conditions, um, which is typically used in the DTC and PTC or the predictive talk control and the direct talk control. We shall see that later on. Okay, for this uh, three phase two level BSI, there are eight possible switching states as shown here by this vector voltage vectors diagram here, which can also be uh, you know, uh, expressed in terms of the switching states of the inverter S A S B and S C here, where S can be either one or two, one or zero. If it is one, then the upper switch of the leg is turned on, and if it is zero, which means that the lower leg of the uh, of the uh, of the switch is turned on. All right. So now let's look at on how the induction motor is uh, uh, controlled. Oh, sorry, is modeled first. Um, this is a diagram of the three-phase induction motor. You have a three-phase axis there for stator, for the ABC, and also the three-phase axis for the rotor. There, this axis there is actually showing the magnetic axis of the stator and as well as the rotor. The angle there is the angle between the axis of the stator, the magnetic axis of the stator, and the magnetic axis of, of, the, of the rotor. Now, modeling, the, modeling this uh, three-phase induction motor in the ABC coordinate system is very complex because of the a magnetic coupling between the stator phases, the rotor phases, as well as the stator and the rotor phases. Uh, you will end up with a very complex equation. For example, here, uh, this is the stator voltage equations expressed in the, uh, uh, equa uh, where VABC uh, and the rest here is basically a vector, uh, as well as this is the rotor voltage equations, which describe the rotor circuits, okay? Uh, D psi, D ABCC, and D psi ABC, ABC are there, is the um, induced voltage due to the rotating flux, uh, which is coming from the stator as well as from the rotor currents. And if you if you uh, if you write down this equation in terms of the matrix, which is shown here, you, you can see that these two um, dash box here is represents the relationship between the voltage in the current, the voltage of the stator, and the current of the uh, of the uh, the, ro ro the rotor current as well as the voltage of the rotor and the stator of the, uh, the, the current of the stator. And this mutual inductance, which relates this, is basically depends on time. For example, uh, which is depends on the rotor positions, therefore depends on time. As you can see here, which relates the uh, mutual, uh, the flux linkaging, linkaging the uh, stator windings, which is caused by the rotor current here, which is basically that part of the uh, matrix here, depends on the rotor position theta r. Okay, as well as the one here, which is uh, linking the uh, the flux, which is linking the rotor circuit, which is coming from the stator current here, also depends on the rotor positions. So the equations is basically uh, time varying equations, which depends on the uh, rotor positions as well as time. Um, so in order to remove that time varying system, we will use Instead of, instead of using the three-phase modeling of the induction motor, typically in high-performance applications, we use the space vector modeling techniques. Okay, this is the definitions of the space vector. A is just a unique vector which represents the three-phase um, the three-phase um, uh, separations, space distribution windings on, on the uh, three-phase uh, induction machines. For example, if you have a three-phase sinusoidal voltage there, and at a particular point of time shown here then the space vector can be represented by just adding the three terms there, which is phase A, phase B, and phase C. At that point of time, you see that phase B there and phase C there is a negative, has a negative value, which is the reason why you have that negative part of the vector there. Okay, this is the positive B, positive C, you have a negative C and negative C there. You just multiply the instantaneous value of VB, VB with A and instantaneous values of VC with A squared, which is given by that vector there then you will add that, uh, and then you get the resultant, which is shown by the black uh, vector here. If this is sinusoidal, meaning that that black vector there, that black, black, uh, you know, the resultant, which is the space vector of the voltage there, is basically going to be rotating at a speed, which is determined by the frequency of this three-phase voltage supply here. 
Now this voltage vectors uh, is a complex number, uh, which means that we can actually resolve that into the DQ axis by taking the imaginary part, the real part of that vector, then we obtain the real part of that vector, which can be written in terms of the VA, VB, and VC there. And we take, if we take the imaginary part of that vector, then we obtain the, D, the Q part or the imaginary part of that vector, which can be represented by a vector shown here. Now, this, if this vector is multiplied by what we call the uh, vector rotator there, which is e to the power of minus j theta, what happened is that you can uh, actually uh, introduce, you are basically introducing another coordinate system here, which rotates at a speed, which is determined by that rate of change of that angle alpha there. Okay, for example, here, if you multiply that and you will get these equations here, which means that if you draw the vector here, then you can see that there is a new coordinate system, which is basically rotating, um, which is defined by, by that angle alpha there, which means that if this coordinate system rotates synchronously with that vector, as I said earlier, at a synchronous speed, then if we resolve the D and Q component of this vector to this rotating axis here, then we'll see that this D and Q component is basically DC quantities which is very convenient uh, later on for us to develop the FOC uh, control algorithms. All right, uh, so if we uh, apply these transformations from ABC to the uh, uh, space vector for these induction machines, we will end up with these uh, equations here, which is <clears throat> expressed in the space vector, the stator and the rotor voltage equations. But however, since the, uh, the rotor is still moving, relative to the stator windings, the D DQ axis of the rotor is still moving relative to the stationary DQ axis of the winding, there will still build a mutual inductance between the stator and the rotor, which will depend on the rotor positions, okay, which is not good for us because they, that will, you know, result in a varying time varying uh, nonlinear system. So in order to remove that uh, time varying uh, component there, which is the uh, coupling of between the stator and the rotor, what we can do is we can transform everything into the same reference frame, which means that, which is either stationary or moving, which means that uh, there will be no relative motion between this DQ of the stator and DQ of the rotor, which means that now the coupling or the, um, in the mutual inductance between the two, between the stator and the rotor now is becoming, is independent of time, which is not changing with time. And we can, based on that, we can actually write down the equations of the space vector here. As you can see here, the flux linkage of the stator now is no longer con containing the uh, time uh, dependent component, which is uh, depending on the rotor positions there anymore. So, and we can also express this voltage in any reference frame that we want, any arbitrary frame that which we get, which is rotating at any arbitrary speed. All right, and then combine these equations with the torque equations, and we have a complete model of the uh, induction motor, electrical model of the uh, induction motor, which will be used later on to develop this uh, FOC, DTC, and as well as MPC or the PTC. All right, let's look at the first modeling, which is the field-oriented control. There are various types of FOC. Uh, you can have the state of flux FOC, for example, you can have the rotor flux FOC, you have the magnetizing flux FOC, which depends on how you define the uh, orientations is. Okay, if you want, if you are orientation, orientating everything to the rotor flux, then we call the rotor flux FOC. Uh, what I'm going to discuss here is just the rotor flux FOC in which everything is oriented to, to the uh, uh, coordinate system, which is fixed or aligned to the rotor flux. And in order to do that, we have to define the torque in terms of the rotor flux and the stator current, which is uh, shown here, which is expressed in the DQ axis. Here. All right, so if we draw this vector um, of this uh, rotor flux and the state of current and resolve this component into its D and Q component as shown here, as you can see that in order to control the torque here, it's not going to be easy. All right, if, for example, if I control the torque by controlling the state of current, which is only accessible to me or to us, uh, the state of current is, is accessible to us, not the rotor flux. Okay, then I will also affect the rotor flux Q component here, which is on the other side of these uh, terms of expressions of the torque here. All right, and if I want, if I just controlling the D component of the stator current here, I will also affect the D component of the rotor flux, which is completely different from the you know torque expressions that we've seen in the DC motor, where we have no coupling between the uh, torque and the flux component. 
uh, if I just control the armature, then that will not affect the flux. All right. So in order to transform this into uh, the torque expression similar to the, what we have in DC motor, what we can do is that we define a new coordinate systems here, which is um, um, which is aligned to the state of flux. Sorry, to the rotor flux here, which means that the Q component of this rotor flux in our new coordinate system, which is rotating synchronously with the rotor flux, is going to be equals to zero. All right, there is no Q component in this rotating reference frame here, um, and which means that we can control the torque easily because everything now the torque equations now can be transformed into a new um, equations form of equations which is shown here where we remove the q component of the rotor flux and the d component of the rotor flux is in this case is equal to the magnitude of the rotor flux itself here all right so this as you can see if you compare to the uh, torque ex expressions of the dc motor is similar uh, has the same uh, has the same uh, you know uh, char uh, characteristics there in which you can quickly control the torque by controlling the Q component of the state of current in this rotating frame. All right, and uh, you can of, of, of fix the flux by keeping that D component of the state of current. And remember that this uh, Q, these uh, rotating coordinates here is rotating synchronously with the uh, uh, rotor flux here, which is rotating synchronously with the uh, state of current vector here, which means that everything here, when you resolve this is to this DQ axis here, is going to be appear as DC, right? So in order to implement this, then we have to know the positions of the rotor flux, which is, um, you know, for us to transform from the stationary to the rotating and then from the rotating to the stationary back in order to implement the current control. And in order to do that, uh, there are two types of uh, control or method to do that, which is uh, the indirect or the direct FOC. I'm just going to discuss the indirect FOC due to the line time limitations here. As you can see, uh, you have the rotating frames here, which is everything expressed in the DC quantities, which is uh, controlled in the rotating frames. And we have the stationary frames when it comes to the implementations to the actual hardware circuit here. And in order to transform that rotating frames to the stationary, we have to know the rotor positions there. Right, so the uh, how to obtain that reference signal, uh, the, the state of current uh, D and Q component, as well as the sleep of the of the uh, of the uh, rotor flux, is to uh, examine the uh, examine the rotor flux voltage equations here. Right, this is the rotor flux voltage equations expressed in the rotating reference frame. Um, and since we cannot access the rotor current here, the rotor current is, is substituted with the uh, current rotor current obtained from the rotor flux linkage equations here. And then if you ex substitute that into this equation here, then you end up with these equations here. And then if you resolve this into the D and Q component here, then you can see that you will end up with these two equations here. As you can see here that the, the flux in this rotating frame here is basically just the magnitude of the rotor flux. And then there is no Q component of the rotor flux equations here. All right. And then um, the difference in the speed there, which is the speed of the rotor flux and the rotor uh, speed there, is basically the sleep. So combining these two equations here with the top equations, then we can actually derive the reference for the uh, state of current D, the state of current Q, as well as the sleep. Right, which is what we need, all this expressed in the rotating reference frame. Then once we have that, then we can implement the control of the FOC, which is shown here. All right, so we have the three equations there to derive the D and Q of the state of current in these rotating frames, which is derived from the reference stock and the reference flux here. And then in order to implement that, we have to transform that back to the stationary frames there and we obtain the rotor flux positions by adding the sleep, which is also calculated from there, uh, with the rotor voltage, with the rotor, with the sense or with the speeds uh, of the rotor, which is uh, using a sense using the mechanical sensor there, and then integrate it to get the rotor positions. As you can see, that the uh, the structure here is a feed forward structure. The the direct FOC, on the other hand, which I'm I'm not going to show, is the uh, uh, has a feedback structure and this forward structure here is very sensitive to parameter variations 
um, uh, uh, which is uh, you know one of the prob main problem of the FOC. Now let's move on to the um, let's move on to the direct top control now. <clears throat> the uh, direct top control is basically uh, as um, is introduced or uh, by you know the Japanese one uh, the Japanese professor and the German professor about um, a decade and a half after FOC was introduced. Right, the, the structure, as you can see here, is very simple. Uh, it has no frame transformation. It has no um, a current control regulator here. The selections of the voltage vectors is, is uh, determined by this voltage vector selector, which is basically a lookup table, depending on the torque and the flux demand, as well as the rotor flux positions there. All right, so the question is, of course, how you uh, build that uh, voltage vector selector there in order to control the torque and the flux at the same time. All right, so let's see how the flux is controlled first. We start off with the uh, rotor flux state of voltage equations here, and then approximating the, uh, the, uh, the ohmic drop uh, across the RS that is negligibly small. Then we can say that the change in the state of flux is equals to the voltage vectors time the change in time, all right, based on that equations there which means that we can control the change in the state of flux by selecting the suitable voltage vectors. <clears throat> there are eight possible voltage vectors which is available for us to select uh, from the two level three phase voltage source inverter, right? For example, if, I, if this is a, a, a state of flux vector there, and in, I want to control the change or the directions of the profile of this uh, state, of flux, state of flux vector, then, I can choose a voltage vector, for example, given by V4 there. You know, this, this is the states of the switching vector of, of this uh, three-phase voltage source inverter. By doing that, then I will direct a new positions of the state of flux there. Then if I want to move further the state of flux to a new direction, then probably I can choose V5 there that will give you a new state or positions of the state of flux there. Combining the two in a very short time, then you will have something like that in which I can uh, pro control the projectile or the profile of the state of flux to whatever profile that I want by, by selecting a suitable voltage vectors. Now for the uh, DTC drive, we typically hold the state of flux constant within the base speed. And then that will result in a circular uh, profile of the state of flux. Um, we control the state of flux by controlling it within the uh, hysteresis band of the state of flux, which is defined by that. And we also divide the state of flux plate into six sector, sectors there. For example, if I am in sector one there, okay, then in order to control the flux within the hysteresis band, then I will choose V3 and V2 there. Then if I move to the new sector, then I will choose a different set of voltage vectors, which is V3 and V4, and so on to V uh, sector three, uh, then I will move to a new uh, set of voltage vectors until um, sector uh, six there, which I use a V1 and V2 again to control the increase and the decrement of the state of flux. <clears throat> All right, or in, in general, if you are in the case sector, then you can have K plus one vector to increase and K plus two vector to reduce. For example, if I am in sector three, then I will use four sector voltage vector four to increase and voltage vector five to reduce the flux. The question is now, how are we going to use the same vector to control the torque, all right? Because we have to control the torque and the flux at the same time uh, using the same voltage vectors. We do that by looking at the voltage, uh, by the, looking at the torque equations as shown here, uh, in which uh, the flux or the, sorry, the torque is basically controlled by, by, by controlling the angle between the state of flux and the rotor flux. This is the magnitude of the state and the rotor flux um, which is held constant within the hysteresis band, all right? So if you can control the angle, then you can control the torque. For example, you have the state of flux here and the rotor flux there. This is the angle between the two. If I select a voltage vectors to increase the flux here, and at the same time, I will increase the angle, meaning that by, by doing that, I will increase the torque as well as increase the flux. On the other hand, if I choose a voltage vectors, that voltage vectors, which is to reduce the flux, but still increasing the angle, then I will increase the torque, but now I'm decreasing the flux, All right? Another way is to use the, act, the active reverse voltage vector, which is opposing the rotations of the flux 
which means that if I use um, I increase the flux there, then I will reduce the angle, which means that by controlling the flux, uh, by controlling the torque, which is reducing the angle to reduce the torque, I will also increase the flux. Now, if I choose a different voltage vectors, that will also decrease the angle, which is also increase the torque, but now reducing the flux, then I will also increasing the torque and reduce the flux. That is another, the third last way of doing to control the torque is to just apply a zero voltage vectors because we know from the equations that zero voltage vectors will end up with the uh, state of flux not moving or not changing with time, which means that um, what happened is that the rotor flux will move closer to the state of flux, which means that the torque will, will decrease slowly. And this ha uh, when this happens, uh, the, the flux is basically it's not moving. Theoretically, it will not move with time uh, because of the zero voltage vectors application. So by, by selecting the suitable voltage vectors, uh, depending on the uh, sector or the positions of the state of flux there, we can use this lookup table here, which is shown here, to select the suitable voltage vectors to uh, con uh, simultaneously control the, the torque and the flux demand, uh, which, uh, as I said, depends on the flux positions here. Okay, let's move on to the last control, which is the uh, predictive torque control. I'm sorry, I'm going very fast here to catch up with the time with time here. All right, uh, the uh, MPC is basically, um, as I mentioned here, is applied to a slower to a system with slower process time or larger time constant before, like for example, in the petrochemicals in early 1990s. But the applications to the power electronics only appear around in, in the year 2000, um, where the fast processor with the help of FPGA, for example, is made it possible for us to apply this MPC in real time for the power electronic system, which much, much smaller time constant. Okay, uh, according to these classifications of, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, before that, let me just give a credit to the three pioneers of the MPC, which I think is going to be Professor Holtz, uh, which wrote a paper or applied this MPC earlier in 1984, during that time to control the current. And then we have Professor Connell, which, which is famous for his generalized MPC. And then we have Professor Rodriguez from Chile, which is uh, famous for his uh, finite control set, FSC uh, MPC. According to uh, a paper which is shown here, the classifications of MPC can be classified into two types, which is the continuous control set where the uh, actuating signals, which is basically can be a voltage reference, for example, is a continuous signal, which means that in order to implement the CCS MPC, we have to have a modulator. And then uh, later, uh, Rodriguez introduced what he called the finite control set MPC or FCS, in which the modulator is not at all. And the implementations of MPC is very much simplified compared to the uh, continuous uh, control set CCS MPC, um, uh, which is uh, uh, shown here. All right, uh, FC, FCS MPC can be further classified into two types which is the OSS MPC, which is the optimal sequence switching MPC, uh, which has the prediction horizon, which is uh, more than two, two or more higher, which means that the prediction is, uh, is performed as two step ahead or larger. And then we have a short prediction horizon or called as the optimal switching vector MPC in which the prediction is only performed a step ahead where N is equals to one. This, this is also known as a predictive top control here, which I'm going to talk about here uh, very briefly here. So the model is basically um, uh, developed using the um, original uh, without, any, without any modulator there, the converter. And then uh, the feature of PTC is very intuitive. It is, we can incorporate nonlinear functions of the of the model into the uh, PTC algorithm does not require a modulator. And you also, it is also possible to remove the cascade structure of the drive systems, all right, if, if we want to remove it. And then another powerful feature of the PTC is that the constraints can be added to the cost functions. Let us look at how this works. You know, for a two level voltage source inverter, we have seven possible models that we can predict, okay? Uh, because two level, uh, two level three phase voltage source inverter has eight possible voltage vectors, two of which are zeros. 
So there are eight possible models that can uh, we predict or we can use to predict the behavior or uh, the torque and the flux there. And then uh, by using this prediction model, uh, we will select the, the one, the cost function, the, the voltage vectors that will give the least value of the cost function. You can see the different, the main difference between PTC and the feedback structure is that, you know, you compare the reference here with the future value. Whereas in your feedback system, you are comparing the reference with the already happened uh, control variables, which is, or, you know, you have a feedback system. Here we are comparing that with a future value, which means that we have the options of selecting which of these voltage vectors will give you, will minimize the cost functions here, right? Let's look at one by one here for the, particularly for this PTC here. You know, the state observer, which is to estimate the state of flux in the rotor flux there. We can use the three equations from the voltage, uh, voltage vectors equations, sorry, the uh, space vector equations of the induction motor that we have seen uh, before to uh, uh, predict the state of flux and the rotor flux by discret discretizing the uh, state of voltage equation, equation using the Euler forward method. Right, so we have the predicted value of the state of flux here, and then from there we can use the uh, um, this uh, rotor flux linkage equations in order to predict the rotor flux. This uh, predicted state of flux and rotor flux is going to be used later to predict the torque and the uh, state of flux, which is shown in the next steps here. In order to predict the torque, then you have to use the future value or the predicted value of the state of current as well as the predicted value of the rotor flux. Now the predicted value of the state of flux is obtained from the same equations, but instead of using the current uh, pre uh, esti uh, uh, the previous values of the state of flux, we use the estimated values of the state of flux, which means that we can use that, uh, we can obtain the predictions of the state of flux there. To predict the current is going to be not that uh, straightforward. We have, you have to use all these four equations here to derive these equations uh, shown here, all right, which is a predicted predict current uh, where the constants there, the, um, the tau sigma, the tau sigma, the r sigma, and kr there, all depends on the parameters of the machines. <clears throat> now, the cost function is very, very powerful because you can actually um, um, <clears throat> uh, add uh, the simplest one, for example, for this PTC here, is where you want to minimize the uh, torque. Um, reference with the predicted uh, predicted talk reference uh, predicted talk here and you also want to minimize the talk re flux reference with the predicted uh, flux value here w wt there is a weighting factor which is because these two units are of different uh, these two variables are of a different unit then you have to have that weighting factor there to emphasize which one is more important than the other all right so this is the most basic cost functions for this ptc to minimize that error all right, uh, you can add, as I said, constraint to this. For example, if, if you add a constraint to the switching number here, where n is the number of the uh, difference between the uh, predicted switching states and the previous states, then if you add that, then that will also minimize, which means that we will try to minimize the switching frequency of the inverter there, okay, by adding that uh, simple. Uh, uh, term there in the cost function. For example, if you have, if you, if you can see here, this is the top reference without n or with lambda there, which is the weighting, weighting factor set to zero, then we have a top um, response here, which is very fast as you can see. And this is the voltage vectors, which is used to select that voltage vectors. Now, if I add the uh, component of the switching frequency there to the cost function, then I will get a different waveform here where you can see now that the switching is reduced, all right? The switching of reduced. The good or the uh, most uh, important uh, behavior characteristics of this two waveform is you can see that you can reduce the switching frequency, but you are not compromising that with the top response. You see the top response there is still good as with the higher switching frequency, which is not possible at all if you are using a linear regulator where you have to compromise between the dynamics of the torque and the switching frequency. All right, so um, I have another five minutes on, probably I will extend that for another five minutes. We have 10 minutes just to discuss on the previous, uh, uh, you know, research um, uh, work that we have done previously in, in at UTM, which is related to the high performance uh, induction motor drive. 
For example, we have done some works on FOC, the field oriented control, to study the modeling and the uh, control of the structure, uh, structurally unbalanced induction machines, where the uh, uh, where, for example, there is a phase faulty phase in one of the phases, uh, which is credit credited to my uh, former PhD students, Dr. Uh, Janati and Monadi. And we also have uh, done some work on the uh, hybrid energy storage systems, uh, which is performed by Dr. Ari Watanasan, sorry, uh, uh, Ari uh, Chaipat, sorry, Ari, um, uh, what is it? The name is very complex, I can't remember there. <laughs> He's from Thailand. And then we have the um, uh, also done several works on DTC, which is credited to my uh, former PhD students like Dr. Azani, Dr. Toh Chuen Ling, Dr. Ibrahim, Dr. Tole, Dr. Yahya, just to name a few. And this is what I'm going to present here in this slide here. And currently we are also doing some work on the MPC or PTC, as well as some work on DTC and the hybrid electric vehicles. <clears throat> Most of the motor drive uh, research is conducted at uh, UTM Photon Future Drive Lab, which is shown here, which is located in Skudai. So the first one we're going to very briefly look at is the uh, variable switching frequency and high torque ripple problem, which is typically the problem faced by the hysteresis-based DTC. You know, uh, theoretically, <clears throat> um, the uh, switching of the inverter occur whenever the torque touches the upper and the lower band of the hysteresis uh, uh, talk control here, as you can see here, All right? Whenever it touches the upper band, there will be a new state of uh, switching states here that has to be selected. Whenever it touches the lower band here, then you have a new switching states that have to be selected, which means that the switching frequency basically depends on the slope of the talk. And the slope of the talk, in this case, depends on the operating conditions, which are the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the load, the load talk, which depends on the speed of the motor, which depends on the DC voltage and so on. So you end up with a variable switching frequency, which is not good for motor drives because that is very difficult to, uh, for example, design the filter for the uh, inverter, then you have to use, uh, uh, you, you, don't, you don't know what is gonna be the switching frequency because it is variable, then it is difficult to design the filter. As well as you don't will not be uh, utilizing the capability of the switching devices. Uh, 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 at its uh, uh, highest capability because you have to determine the worst case conditions in order to select the switching devices, right? Now, there's another problem uh, with the DTC uh, implemented using the hysteresis uh, comparator is that ideal implementation is that you will have the talk confined within the hysteresis band. But when you implement that digitally, then you can see that the talk can go beyond that. For example, if you do a sampling somewhere here, then the next, sorry, sampling here, then the next sampling happens here in which the talk already go pass through beyond the talk reference here, all right? And this thing get worse is if the sampling is larger, all right? So two problems, variable switching frequency and higher talk ripple. This is the actual waveform obtained from the actual drive systems. As you can see that the circle there mark the uh, conditions in which the go the, the top goes beyond the hysteresis band or the reference here. And in fact, it touches the upper band there, which causes a reverse voltage factor selections and then further causes the, uh, uh, the top ripple, as you can see there. Now, in order to overcome this problem, we because the root cause is basically coming from the, uh, from the uh, hysteresis controller there, what we do is that we just replace that with what we call the constant switching frequency controller. And we managed to publish this in the IEEE transactions on industrial electronics, uh, where the hysteresis controller that is replaced by a, you know, a familiar linear regulator, which is similar concept to the current control regulator, uh, where we can use a PI controller to design the controller there. To, to design the control system there, which means that we have to linearize the talk loop, average and linearize the talk loop and design the PI controller using the, uh, you know, the convention, uh, the, using the, uh, linear, the linear control system design tools. All right, this is the implementation of the systems. As you can see, this consists of the uh, DS1104 or DS1103, and then we have the FPGA to implement the lookup table. We have the uh, um, uh, voltage source inverter there. This is the picture of the hardware there, and this is the results. You can see the hysteresis controller compared with the constant switching frequency that which reduce the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, ripple there as well as you can see that. However, you can see that the torque dynamic is slightly uh, degraded there with concentration frequency, which is what we expect because hysteresis control, as I said, has a very excellent dynamic response compared to the linear regulator. Uh, this is the uh, a spectrum of the volt of the current for the hysteresis. You have a distributed frequency spectrum, whereas for the concentration frequency, we have a fixed switching there, which occur at 2.2 kilohertz there. Next step is that we remove the uh, flux as well, hysteresis controller with the constant switching frequency controller. And we managed to publish there in the, also in the output transactions on industry applications, uh, where we need to more model the talk loop there, okay? Um, by again, linearizing and averaging and linearizing the talk loop. And then we can therefore design the linear controller, the PI controller there in order to control the flux. And this is the results that you can see that this is switching at a higher, much higher switching frequency of around 10 kilohertz because you use the FPGA to implement the controller instead of the field, for, uh, instead of the uh, uh, DSP or the processor, we use the FPGA to implement the controller. So which, which allow us to increase the switching frequency up to 10 kilohertz. And you can see that the ripple is almost not there from this uh, scope. And the current is uh, has a smoother with a much lower uh, harmonics there compared to the hysteresis implementations there. This is the spectrum of the current. As you can see that it is more defined at 10 kilohertz there, around 10 kilohertz at the switching frequency of the top controller, uh, uh, compared to the more di distributed you know, switching frequency uh, when we implement it using the hysteresis controller. The next um, work on the DC, DTC is to look, on, to look at on the, uh, uh, the over, uh, the uh, the over dynamic over modulations and to improve the torque dynamics of the system, all right. Um, because in the conventional DTC, there is no uh, smooth transitions from from PWM to the six step voltage when you go the, when you uh, run the speed beyond the base speed. Okay, what we do is that we introduce a method to smoothly transit the pulse phase modulation waveform into a six step waveform by modifying the uh, state of flux voltage vectors before it is fed to the lookup table, all right? Um, we managed to publish two papers here in the IEEE transactions on power electronics as well as the IEEE transactions on the industrial electronics, one on the uh, uh, dynamic talk, one on the uh, dynamic over relations, the other is to improve the dynamic talk. This is the implementation, as I said earlier, you add that modification block the output of that uh, hysteresis controller there in order to transit the, uh, the pulse phase modulations to a six step waveform there. Uh, we use the constant switching frequency controller, which is shown here. This is the result. This is without the uh, smooth transitions from PWM to the six step. As you can see that using the hysteresis controller, you still have a pulse phase modulation there, okay, which is not a completely six step. Uh, waveform, but using the uh, method that we introduced, you can see a smooth transitions from the pulse phase modulation. This is a voltage, okay, from the pulse phase modulations to a completely six step waveform there, which means that we basically extend the constant top region of the drive systems if, in doing so. And this is the dynamic uh, improved dyna top dynamic response, where during the top dynamic here, this is the top can see that there is a multiple voltage vectors selector here due to the selections, due to the uh, state of flux regulator there. What we propose is that to use a single voltage vector there during the torque dynamic, which significantly improve the torque dynamics as you can see here, all right? However, by doing so, we are compromising the torque, uh, you know, the top, the state of flux profile to not becoming a circular, but there is a slight glitch there in the state of flux there because of the single voltage selections during the top dynamics there. And then the final one that I would like to share is the one which is a constant switching frequency here, uh, uh, drive systems, also DTC, but uh, we have also found out by using, by using the constant switching frequency controller, we managed to improve the flux regulations. And by improving the flux regulations, we also managed to improve the speed estimation. And the speed estimation that we perform here is using a standard EKF based estimator. And the result is shown here, where you can see that um, this is a step change of speed from 10 radian per second to zero, 
with the hysteria is there, the flux regulation is completely out of control, right? And which, re which resulted in a speed estimation, which is not going to be accurate there, all right? But with the constant switching frequency there, even though the speed goes to zero, the state of flux managed to be regulated to, to its uh, rated value, which means that the, the estimation of the speed there, which is shown in the red there, compared to the measured value in the black there, is also improved, all right? This is the speed error there. This is the uh, another waveform which shows the, during the startup, we, start, we step the speed from zero to a very low speed of 10 radian per second there because of the poor flux regulations at low speed there then you have a huge error of the estimated speed error there using the extended common filter. But with the constant switching frequency controller, which managed to maintain the flux regulation to its rated value, then the speed estimations there is maintained to its, uh, which is nicely following the measured value there. Okay, uh, uh, this is the speed, this is the torque there, and then this is the uh, flux there, and then this is the current there. All right, so as a final remark before I stop is that um, I would like to say that the advancement of these uh, induction motor drives is basically due uh, to the uh, advancements in the power electronics technology, which is the converted top topologies as well as the control topologies, as well as more importantly, I think is on the advancement of the powerful processor uh, combined with the FPGA, which um, you know, some of the control which was introduced earlier cannot be implemented because of these limitations can now be implemented. For example, the MPC, which is previously uh, only uh, you know, limited to the slow process system now can be implemented to a very large, to a very fast processing system with smaller time constants, such as the power transit systems. Uh, and it is anticipated for the drive, um, motor drives applications or research area, I think over the next few years, the importance, uh, the research uh, is going to be focused mainly around that MPC, which is a model predictive uh, control uh, system. All right, with that, I think I will end my presentation. Sorry for taking up more time here. Okay, thank you. Prof, I have one question. Yeah, sure. That uh, you said that uh, you are working on hybrid storage devices. Uh, yeah, we yeah we, we have done that actually one of my PhD student for my fishes. So yes. Yeah. What what was the actual problem? Um, we actually tried to combine you know the uh, for the electric vehicles you have conventionally you only have the uh, you only have the battery for the energy storage. What we try to do there is to include the supercapacitor as part of the energy storage systems. Uh, that supercapacitor, which is used to uh, reduce the stress of the, you know, the current, high current during the accelerations of the battery, and as well as can, uh, we have shown in a paper that we have published that by using that supercapacitor as part of the energy storage system can also extend the traveling range of the electric vehicles. You know, the challenging part, part is, of course, to control that supercapacitor. And then we have to control the voltage as well as the current of the supercapacitor. And we did that actually by using a linear regulator, which is a PI controller, um, uh, you know, to, uh, to exactly control the current and the voltage of the supercapacitor in order to effectively reduce the, uh, the stress on the battery, right? As well as to improve on the accelerations of the, of the motor drives.